Thanks, everyone. I'll try not to be redundant. I mean, there, there are in some ways only so many things one can say about gold. Um, I'm here mostly to talk about the practicalities of investing in gold. I'm not going to tell you whether gold's going up or down, whether you should or shouldn't be in gold. Um, I actually don't really disagree with much of what James has said, although I think sometimes we've been set up as foils on some issues like ETFs in particular. Uh, but I don't really disagree with most of that. What I do think I can help do is keep you from making some critical mistakes in expressing your opinion one way or another. Whether you think gold is going to go up or down, maybe you want to short gold. There are really bad ways to do that, too. So I'm going to try to keep you from making the worst mistakes. Um, who am I? My name is Dave Nodig. I work for a little company called Index Universe. We're primarily a media company. We focus on indexes and exchange-traded funds, most of which are index-based. Uh, we run things like the Exchange Traded Funds Report, which is the longest ETF uh, newsletter and the longest running ETF newsletter in the world. We run the biggest ETF conferences here and in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. My personal bailiwick, honestly, is I focus mostly on commodities. It's the thing that I think is most interesting. I think it's the the area where research pays off the most. Um, let's face it, there are an awful lot of analysts covering IBM. You don't need another guy like me telling you how to think about IBM. Commodities, however, I think is a different animal. So let me tell you a few ways that I'm thinking about it. First of all, I just want to hit a couple charts to reiterate some of what these guys said about the alpha case for gold. Why is gold going to do better than the cash you leave in Lenox Savings Bank down the street? So low correlation to most assets. Most people have seen this chart before. That's the reason why an investment advisor might be talking to you about gold. They're talking about, well, you want something that's going to go up when the market's going down. That's great. We all want that. And in fact, yeah, over time, over the long haul, these are charts from 1987, which I stole from my friend Jason Toussaint at the World Gold Council. Yeah, it's a low correlation asset. This is the juicy chart, though. What this shows you in the two lighter colored bars is the tail risk days or weeks in the S&P 500. So pick a week where the S&P 500 went up 2% or more or down 2% or more, and gold has historically done exactly what you wanted it to do. When the S&P went like this, gold went up. But when the S&P went up, gold kind of went up too. So it's done exactly what you want in those tail risk weeks in the market. That's great, awesome. This is the problem. This is the daily correlation of gold to the S&P 500. There's no trend here, right? There, there really isn't, sorry. Um, you know, the, the, the message here is not that gold is or is not correlated. It's that those correlations can shift on a dime with investor opinion. This is uh, averaging that out over weeks instead of days. Daily correlation is kind of cheating because the data is easy to fudge. This is weekly correlations, which smooths things out. Again, periods of negative correlation to the S&P 500, periods of positive correlation. I'm not smart enough to tell you which one, but what I can tell you is, boy, does it change its mind really, really fast, right? You're in something you think is going to be negatively correlated. A week later, you've got 95% correlation. That's difficult to manage. But on the other hand, it's a commodity. It fundamentally does trade on supply and demand. If more people want to buy it than is available, the price goes up, et cetera. We heard about the demand in China and India, which is what this is mapping out. And indeed, yeah, we've got China and India now 40% of global demand up from 24% in 2000. Those also happen to be the world's two most populous countries and ones that have economies that are frankly often seem to be doing better than ours. But here's mine production. We saw this too. Mine production is effectively flat. This is actually a good thing if you're a gold investor because if there was, in fact, an elastic relationship with the ability of a miner to produce more gold when the price went up, gold wouldn't go up, right? There'd be an equilibrium price point, just like the market for eggs, right? If, the, if enough people want to buy eggs, people will start breeding chickens. That can't happen. Even worse, this is the rising costs. We just saw a chart on that keeps going up and up and up, and it's certainly not going to be coming down anytime soon. We've, you know, people talk about peak oil. Well, this is pretty much, we're way past peak gold. It's just getting more expensive to get gold out of the ground. And this is new discoveries. You want to talk about peak gold. People are spending three and a half billion dollars a year trying to find more gold, and they're failing worse and worse every single year. It's getting harder and harder to find a new source of gold. So why not buy gold? That's the case for why gold's going to go up. So here's all the negative reasons. And James actually hit on quite a few of these. It's not actually an asset, right? Look at the bottom of this. Doesn't pay any interest. 
doesn't pay any dividends, doesn't give you any claim on some other asset. You're not getting your share of a factory in Iowa. You're not getting a share of some government's ability to generate wealth in the future. Um, and it has virtually no utility. I mean, we talk about jewelry demand, but that jewelry demand is fundamentally investment demand. Most of that jewelry is being bought not just because something's pretty, but because there's this belief that it's valuable. It's being bought as jewelry to be used as a store of wealth. And that value is based on thinking, which many people call delusional, right? It's only valuable because James and I come up with an agreement about how expensive should gold be today. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Guess what? That's how all goods and services are priced, right? If all of a sudden everybody decides Microsoft's going through the toilet, it'll be down 50% tomorrow, whether that's a good thing, bad thing, or a true thing or not. So all asset prices are un fundamentally based on some kind of delusional thinking. But with gold, there's no utility to fall back on. So it is truly subject to mass divestiture and mass acquisition. Uh, and is subject to these kinds of bubble behaviors. And I'm going to argue in a few minutes that I think that it's becoming more and more of a financial asset and less and less of a liquidity asset, which is what you were talking about. And that's not necessarily a good thing if you're trying to figure out, well, how much gold do I want to be putting my overall wealth into? How much liquidity am I trying to hold? And how well is that liquidity going to hold its value over time? So let's talk about the three different ways people get access to commodities, and then I'm going to dive into the ETF side of things. So when I think about the commodities markets, there's really traditionally three ways you get at it. One is the spot price. How much does a bushel of corn cost at the elevator? Right? In the case of gold, that's really easy. The spot price of gold is published all over the place in real time. Um, in, the, in most other commodities, not the case, right? The spot price of corn is different in 45 different grain elevators, and you can't buy it anyway unless you show up with a truck. Um, in futures markets, which is where most of the commodities action happens, the reason people trade corn futures is because nobody wants to take the truck to the grain elevator. In the gold markets, it's not that bad. The, the futures markets actually track the actual spot market very well, precisely because it's so easy to just go get the gold bullion in itself. And then last, we have the equities. In commodities equities, things like oil producers and big agricultural companies, the disconnect between the actual price of the commodity and how that company does is vast. With gold miners in particular, the connection is actually pretty direct. It didn't used to be. It used to be most of those big gold miners ran giant hedging operations, and you were betting as much on the sophistication of the CFO as whether or not the price of gold was going to go up or down. Most of the gold producers, if not all of them, are now completely dehedged, and so their actual revenue stream will be affected by the price of gold, and therefore you can expect miners to do better in an upward gold price market than they would in a downward price market. These are all good things. These make gold actually surprisingly easy to get as a commodity in any of these three ways. But there are pros and cons. What's the downside of actually buying bullion, actually taking physical ownership of gold? Really, there's just one, and it's really expensive. It's not an easy market to get access to. You're going to pay commissions. There are fabrication costs. You know, if, if, when, I, when I first put this chart, gold was only at 1454. Coins were available at 1512. That's just the cost of taking a big giant bar and making it a coins. That takes effort, it takes energy. Somebody has to do that. There's going to be a difference in that price. You also have to pay somebody to store it. Somebody like you know the folks that James worked with. There are vaults that will hold this for you. They're insured, et cetera, and so on. But that's not free either, unless you're going to physically take possession of the actual bullion, you're going to end up paying somebody to store that. Even if it's just you know paying your 40 bucks a year at the safe deposit box in town, you're going to pay something to store that. Generally, you don't have to pay something to say, store your shares of IBM. And last, the spreads can be pretty big too. So you're going to pay more to get it than you are to sell it. That's true when you buy a share of stock. It's true when you buy a house. Uh, it's true in capital markets, period. The spreads in gold for people who are not trading in very large quantities are just simply wider than they are in most financial assets. They're run, they run from 20 to 30 basis points, if you've got a really good deal, up to a percent. So all told, your in and out cost to, say, put a position on in gold for a year or two can be a couple percent. And, there, and that's, a, that's a big cost, right? I mean, in a market where we're talking about T-bills paying basis points, that's a lot of money. 
Um, there are alternatives to this, um, things like digital gold, which James works with. There are pooled vehicles with places like Kitco and Bullion Vault, where you're essentially getting certificates. You're getting sort of notional ownership of shares of a giant pool of gold sitting somewhere else. And there are ETFs, which I'll get to in particular, which have largely replaced a lot of that sort of certificate-based gold in the past. Then there's futures. It's worth at least pointing out that these exist. In the futures, you're not actually buying gold. You're buying a promise from the market to deliver you gold at some future point in time. The biggest problem with that is that that's going to be more or less than the price of gold today. If it's more, that's a situation known as contango, and that costs you money. If it's less than the current cost of gold, you get a little money in return. Um, that roll cost in gold is very cyclical. Um, it tends to be fairly small, generally up or down a percent a year. Um, but being in the futures market involves size, complexity, and leverage. It's not for the faint of heart. However, for a certain class of investor, it's an interesting way to go, and it has some interesting tax ramifications, which I'll hit at the end. Last, there's the, the gold miners. Um, you know, these are fundamentally different than buying gold. You're buying the cow, not buying the milk. And you're making these bets on management and acts of God and whether or not Hugo Chavez is as crazy as we think he is, right? And the answer is often yes. And that's difficult to predict. Those political risks are very real in the gold miner space, particularly when you start looking at the miners. I mean, the, the, the junior miners. Um, just briefly how these have done. This is the, the big miners on the bottom, the junior miners on the top over the last year. Hey, it's hard to look at this chart and not get excited about the top line. I'm an investor like everybody else. You know, if you actually got this right and you bought junior gold miners a year ago, you're up 60-something percent. That's awesome. The problem is you had some pretty terrible days in there where you were down 10% in a day or you were down 20% in two weeks. This is speculation, right? Let's be clear about that. This is not buying gold as a store of value. This is speculating on wildcatters who were out there digging in the dirt hoping to get rich. If you get it right, you make a lot of money. If you don't, you lose a lot of money. Over five years, spots absolutely slaughtered the mining sector in general. Um, this is miners on the bottom, spot on the top. You know, gold's almost, uh, uh, gold's almost up 150% in that time period. Miners haven't come close to that. It's not a bad investment. Uh, it's not like you've lost all your money. But look at 2008. We all know what that looked like. Right? That, these are equities. They're going to perform like equities when they're big negative risk moments in the markets like in 2008. Gold just kind of sat there. I mean, sure, it had its days where it was down a couple percent, but nothing like the rest of us felt in 2008. So let's talk quickly about ETFs, and then we'll move on. So just ETFs 101 in one slide. Uh, most people know what an ETF is. They've been around since I started my career. In 1992, I started working on the first ETFs, so they've been around about 20 years. Um, what is an ETF? It's a mutual fund, which is just a giant pool of assets sliced up into little shares so you can buy a little piece of it. It trades on an exchange, which means it trades intraday, like a stock, and is subject to supply and demand. It can, be worth, it can trade for more or less than it's actually worth. And the reason it still works, even though it can trade more or less than it's worth, is because it exploits the greed inherent in the market-making system in the stock market to keep the prices accurate. It uses arbitrage and the privileged position that market makers have in that market to essentially force their hand to keep this thing in line with its true value. So what does that mean for gold investors? Gold investors have ways of playing all three of these types of gold as commodities, physical gold, the futures markets, the equities markets. Um, this is the currently exhaustive list. Most of these are tiny. This is when you break it down by assets. You've got GLD, which most of you have probably heard of. It's the second largest ETF in the world. It's, I think, the fourth most liquid security in the world. It trades like water. Um, and then underneath it, you have IAU, which is its primary competitor, which does exactly the same thing and costs 15 basis points less. Guess which one I like. Um, then beneath that, you've got the two Van Eck uh, equity products. And then you quickly just fall into the also ran category, where you get down to things like uh, this one, which just blows my mind, which is T-Bar, which is an exchange-traded note. It doesn't actually hold anything. It's just a promise to pay from a bank. And they're promising to pay you the return of their magic black box strategy, which will either be in T-bills or in gold, depending on which one they think is going to go up that week. Yeah. It's worth pointing out this is a relatively new development. Back in 2004, these things didn't exist. All of the money effectively has gone into GLD, first to market. Um, the reason is it trades like water. 
it's really hard to trade $500 worth of gold into the market and $500 worth of gold out of the market in bullion in a day. If you're a hedge fund and you're trying to say do that with $500 million worth of gold in and out, GLD is the only game in town. It's that of the futures market. And so the institutional market that wants to express their opinion on gold has essentially built this product from the ground up. So which one would one choose if one wanted to get into these? Well, a couple things. One is I mentioned the expense ratio right here, that magic 15 basis point different to buy gold bullion. Um, in my opinion, there's never a reason to pay more for something unless you're really feel good about buying expensive stuff. So I, I still don't understand why most people still fall to GLD, except it's the one that's in the headlines all the time. But between this issue of being in bullion, being in miners, being in equities, being in futures, probably the, the big gotcha here is taxation. Right? When you buy gold bullion, and it doesn't matter how you buy it, you can buy it at the fair, you can buy it from James, you can buy it from GLD. When you buy gold bullion, you're not buying an asset. You're buying what the US government considers a collectible, which is kind of quaint. Uh, and that means that if you sell it quick, you're going to pay ordinary income capital gains, just like you would with anything else. And if you sell it after a year, you're paying 28%, which last time I checked is a lot more than the 15% minimum long-term capital gains rate. So you're paying a premium because you're buying a collectible. You're not buying an asset. Uh, which, is, which is kind of bogus. Now, if you bought futures, you have a slightly different situation there. Futures don't get taxed either as long or short term. They get taxed at a blended rate every single year, whether you sold it or not. So if you buy gold futures, or, or the one ETF that tracks gold futures, which will do a very good job of tracking the spot price of gold day after day. You'll do very close to the actual performance of gold, plus or minus a percent or two generally over the course of a year your tax rate is only going to be 23% because that's just how futures are taxed. But you're going to pay that 23% on that year whether or not you actually sold it. And then your basis restarts because the, the IRS and their infinite wisdom thinks that anybody who's in the futures market is a speculator. And therefore, you're just holding inventory. You're getting your inventory mark to market at the end of the year, which is just great. For some investors, this actually makes sense. right? They may actually be in a taxable situation, and this is how they want to manage their tax. They think they're only going to be in for 18 months at a time. They don't want to pay that 28%. The 23% makes more sense, and they don't care that it's getting every year. The big caveat here is you're going to get a K-1 partnership form, and no tax accountant likes to get that. Um, the last one is the ETNs, these exchange-traded notes. I'm not a big fan of any of the ones available in the gold space. They do have the phenomenal tax advantage of being taxed like forwards contracts, which means that you only pay the long-term capital, capital gains rate whenever you decide to sell it, period. Great tax advantage. None of the ones tracking gold are particularly interesting to me. They're kind of goofy. Let's just one last couple questions, couple things about, about selecting these products. Tradeability. Um, as I said, GLD is one of the most liquid securities in the world. It's trading over 3 billion shares a day on an average day. Um, that's a lot of shares, and consequently, the spread is often, and almost always, just a penny, as small as it can be. In the high-frequency trading world, it's usually a hundredth of a penny, um, not that even I can get access to that. So it's sort of got the minimum possible spread for any security in the universe. IAU doesn't trade quite that much. It only trades 180 million shares a day, and consequently, it, it trades with a little bit of a spread. It'll trade out to two or three cents if you get it at the wrong time of the day. So the average spread over the last I think we did this for is this 60 days, I think. I don't know. Stacy put these slides together for me. But I'm pretty sure these are spreads over the trailing 60 days, six basis points. So that does eat some of its 15 basis point cost advantage if you held it for a year. Obviously, if you're buying it for longer than that, you amortize this cost of the, that spread out over time, and it can be de minimis. If you're trading every day, this would make a big difference. Uh, and hopefully, most of you are not trading gold every day. Um, again, the, the equities products are highly liquid. But you quickly fall off this cliff into things that are only trading 100,000 shares a day and are thus a little bit difficult to recommend. Um, a couple quick things about trading in gold. One of the criticisms that people often have about gold, or GLD and IAU in particular, is they don't really track the price of gold. And this is the chart that you'll see them use, or something like it. What this has is the net asset value, which is the take the value of all the gold in the vault, divide it by the number of shares, you get a number versus the actual last price in the marketplace. And if you, look at the, um, if you look at this chart at the bottom, it implies that, well, at the end of the day, 
you're paying more, it's worth more or less in the market than the gold's actually worth in the vault. So this looks like a late, slightly scary chart. Wait a minute, it's going to be 2% off its actual value on any given day. How do I know I'm going to get the right side of it or not? The problem is that the net asset value for bullion almost around the world is generally struck at the London PM fix, uh, which is not 4 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So you're generally marking a 4 p.m. close in the ETF with is it 11 a.m.? Is that the London PM fix? <laughs> yeah, the 11 a.m. fix here in the United States. Gold trades pretty volatile. It's often 2% up or down between 11 and 4, and that's what you're seeing on this chart. Contrast this to my least favorite product in the universe, and I hope somebody will sue me for it. This is the Sprott Physical Gold Trust Closed End Fund, which has been trading at something of like a 10 to 20% premium since the day it launched, based entirely on a campaign of fear that there was something wrong with the ETFs. Therefore, you should spend lots of extra money getting into this closed end fund because they would tell you where the gold was. Well, let me, let me put some of that to bed too. These are the big myths about the gold ETFs and GLD in particular. The first one is, there's no gold in the vault. Well, this is just wrong. Uh, most of the folks running that fund are folks I've worked with for 20 years. Some of them I went to business school with. They've sat there during the audits every year. It's audited by two firms every year independently and has never had a discrepancy. It's being held by HSBC and JP Morgan. They certainly have no vested interest in pretending there's gold in the vault when there's not. Now, I can't tell you that I physically went in and counted all 90,000 bars which back up GLD right now, nor do they. They go in and they statistically sample it uh, basically every 180 days, and they come up with a bar list, and it's never not tied out from that statistical sample where they usually do 20, 15,000 bars, and they actually go through and physically go through the vault and make sure everyone's exactly where it's supposed to be. But then again, hey, you know what? If you really don't believe there's gold in the vault, how sure are you that your shares of IBM are being held in the right account at the depository trust company, which is run by the US government? I actually trust JP Morgan and HSBC and two auditors more. Uh, next one is it's not like owning real gold. Well, it depends what you mean by that. If what you're saying is when gold goes up 20%, I want my thing to go up 20% too, then it's an awful lot like owning real, owning real gold. What most people usually mean is this next one, which is, well, but when the world comes to an end, I can't trade it for food and guns. Now, this is true. It's absolutely true. My shares of GLD, which I, I fair disclosure, I've owned some IAU, a small percent in my portfolio, have for a long time. Uh, those shares are completely worthless in a global financial meltdown that has me hunting for food. Absolutely. But unless you've actually taken your gold coins and stuck them under your mattress or in your wall safe, you're in the same boat. Because chances are, if you're putting more than a couple thousand dollars worth of gold in any container, you're sticking in a bank vault you can't get access to when the world comes to an end either. Uh, or you're trusting a big custodian or a big vault somewhere to hold that asset for you as well. And you're not going to be able to get that out if the world comes to an end either. Uh, other, other big complaints, GLD doesn't actually allocate bars of gold to cover the assets. This is just patently false. They publish the gold bar list every single day. There is a small percentage, anything that's less than a one bar size worth is basically kept in a float account overnight and that's unallocated. Again, they've never failed an audit on this. So a, you have to be a fairly big conspiracy theorist to think that you've got seven, eight, nine firms all trying to play some game here. Um, Next, that the gold is all just leased out and that nobody else is getting that profit except the, the vault. Um, again, you have to believe that an awful lot of people are part of a giant conspiracy for this to happen because they are all by prospectus not allowed to do this. So you have to believe that they're breaking the rules, breaking SEC rules, breaking the London bullion market rules, uh, and violating the, all of the custodial rules that they have set as well. And last, there's counterparty risk. Now, this is actually one that I, I give some credence to. Anytime you buy a security, you've got counterparty risk, right? I'm a Schwab customer, personally. I have fairly big counterparty risk with US Trust. They're the custodian for all of Schwab's assets. If there turned out to be some massive set of fraud going at uh, US Trust, I'm going to have to fall back on my deposit insurance, which is only going to cover me to so much. Uh, if, if my bank goes bust, I've got that counterparty risk too. If I bought gold through any one of the number of bullion services and chosen to trustee that asset somewhere else, 
I have that counterparty risk too. And it's only as good as that company's promise to pay and the insurance that they put on it. So counterparty risk is really the nature of modern markets. It's extraordinarily difficult not to have counterparty risk. If you have dollars in your wallet right now, you've got a whopper and that's the US government. So you're not really gonna get away from that at all. So that's really it for me. I think we have one more presentation and then we're gonna take questions. Yes, thank you.